Cool, so it's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks to the organizers for what's a, a great event. I'm having a lot of fun. Um, I want to, I'm representing quite a large group. You've, many of you will know Equus and CQC, QT, some of the other ARC centers we have in Australia. QDOS is another one where quantum is one of our focuses rather than the sole focus. So, so I'm representing work by quite a lot of universities. Um, exactly what I mean by this title will perhaps become clear, but we're kind of talking about this sort of Frankenstein type objects where there's chips, there's fibers, there's detectors, all mushed together in whatever way is most effective with the technology that we have to hand, which to some extent is the kind of philosophy that QDOS um, adopts. <coughs> I, I had put, when I wrote the abstract, I didn't really know what I meant by road to multi-photo interferometry, so I thought I should have some kind of metaphor. It started to seem a bit cheesy. Um, and then I realized Dowling was going to be after me. So no matter how cheesy I, I am, surely I'll look sober. I am. Um, Thanks, Mike. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I remember that. Yeah, you will. <laughs> this is what QDOS does. QDOS is really this chip in the middle. Um, whatever kinds of technologies you can pile on, metamaterials, photonic crystals, slow light, switching, different material systems, and above all, very high nonlinearity. It really defines what we mean. And in the, the program that we have at the moment, we're in our second cycle, there's really two things at the bottom, which is this sense of pulling together different systems, and in particular, nanophotonic systems. That means metamaterials, that means waveguides with very strong sub systems, a lot of plasmonics, that kind of stuff. And built on that, we then work in three spaces at the moment. One is mid-IR, one is terabit <coughs> per second. Um, and then when we set this program, it, it was just the time when Photonics and quantum were starting to really collide, and so we thought it was a good opportunity to adopt some of that space. Why would we do that as a, a center which has traditionally been about nonlinear optics rather than quantum optics per se? Well, it's because quantum optics is optics, and everyone now believes that really optics belongs on chips as much as possible, and that's what we really do. The kind of vision, here's, here's a, a little plot of Sydney, there's a bunch of universities that work in the quantum space. They all tend to have different technologies. Sydney has a number of, of systems, including ion trap and photonics. UTS is close, and they have interest in uh, nitrogen vacancy up at Macquarie. In the north, we also have NV centers, but we also do waveguide quantum photonics at different wavelengths. And you would like, ultimately, of course, to let all of these systems talk to each other. Perhaps there's something like one of these blind quantum computers at one node. You would like all of those different client technologies to be able to talk to each other across the same installed fiber network. And so a lot of the, the issues that uh, are, play a role in the conventional classical internet Wavelength conversion, routing, low losses are equally as relevant to the quantum space. We just have to take them even more seriously. So the, the, the kinds of traditional things that a nonlinear optics group can think about um, are compelling or have a lot of resonance with the kind of community goals that a quantum center might think about. Um, so we have a lot of people working in this. Um, there's actually seven universities involved. There's four working in the quantum space. Uh, that's Macquarie, Sydney, ANU, and uh, RMIT University in Melbourne. Um, I'll also talk about uh, some work with uh, uh, Sebastian Tanzili's group at Nice. And our key partners in all this work are John Seif in Toronto and Thomas Krauss uh, at York. People in blue are the people mostly involved in the work I'll talk about today. Um, we work in a lot of areas in, in this space. Some of the things I won't talk about, um, we've done some quantum random number generation using spontaneous Raman techniques. This is actually our former science minister meeting our random number generator source. And he was a bit mystified about what exactly this was for. And then someone said, online gambling. Quantum security online gambling. Um, we have also done a uh, fair bit of frequency conversion, getting very high efficiency um, using four-way mixing. And in the group at ANU, uh, there's working photon correlations and two-photon walks, etc. with your high circuits. So if that kind of stuff is interesting, give me a shout later on. What I thought I'd talk about is three different areas. Um, multiplexing single photon sources, so that's the idea of taking uh, nonlinear spontaneous photon sources and trying to make them better to beat um, fairly fundamental uh, constraints. Um, some of the work that we do at Macquarie focused on laser writing technology for quantum. And if I have time, I'll do a bit of theory of uh, single final sources in imperfect systems. 
So as we saw from Andrew yesterday, there's kind of two ways of thinking about making single photons. The way on the left, you try to find a true single uh, atom-like system. Ultimately, that's going to win. <coughs> and once that's done, I think the nonlinear frequency can, or the nonlinear spontaneous processes can pretty much go home. Um, and that may be exactly when that's happening, five, ten years, we don't know. But in the interim, um, the best sources we have are these nonlinear frequency conversion ones. And the, the, the basic scenario is fairly simple. I have some kind of nonlinear material. Um, sitting here, I drive that with a pump laser. Two photons come off. I'll pick up one of them, go click. And then that's an indication that there's probably another photon coming along in the other channel if it hasn't been scattered or lost or absorbed or whatever. So you, you take a system which is unpredictable, it's still unpredictable, but you get a warning. And using that warning to bootstrap a more a, a higher quality system is something I'll, I'll spend a bit of time on. So with uh, the kind of systems we can work with, most people seem to concentrate on the Chi2 systems, where we have um, a single pump photon collapsing to two photons at a lower frequency. More recently, the Chi 3 systems have started to reach more prominence. And quantum mechanically, the system looks very same. The Hamiltonian is essentially identical. But the simple fact that the, the two photons are spread on either side of the pump in most cases tends to have quite important um, consequences when we get down into the nitty gritty of actually making these things go and getting them done. So we'll see some impact of that later on. The points remember that we get more or less one event at a time. Most of the time you'll get nothing. A bit of the time you'll get one event. Some of the time you'll get more. You don't know when that's going to happen. And as a result, in order to get rid of those or to, to reduce, uh, minimize the effect of those higher order processes, people tend to run these things very slowly, with relatively low power pumps. So that most of the time we're going to get nothing. Some of the time we'll get one pair, the higher order ones we don't have to worry about too much. And we've recently uh, written a couple of reviews, both on our work in JHQQE, and uh, there's a new book chapter you know, in a book out from Springer just this month, where we talked about this process in general. Okay, so here's how the, the, the Chi 3 process works. You haven't seen this kind of thing. In, that, in the Chi 3, there's two pump photons coming in, they mix in the, the nonlinear medium, um, provided they generate a pair of photons some of the time. One of them will be pulled off as the herald, the other one we can either detect if we're just characterizing the source or wrap up to somewhere if we want to do something interesting. And uh, there's been a lot of work in these things over the years, starting off in silicon. Um, so there's now silicon devices. We've looked a lot at nonlinear glasses, which we'll talk about. Silicon glass is important, and then more recently, the move into um, compact silicon devices. So, we, for instance, if we heard from Dirk yesterday. A little bit of Theory, not very much. This is the basic Hamiltonian that we're working with. Most of the time, the pump is going to be very strong, so these field operators I could replace with a classical field and just get essentially um, something that's going to collapse into a pair of creation operators. There's, when you look at the final state that comes out of this, there's some vacuum, there's a pair term, the other stuff, there's some scary integrals. But the point to notice is that everything that actually determines the nature of this state, what is the thing that determines how much of every particular frequency I'm going to have, is entirely determined by the kinds of things that classical nonlinear optics has playing, been playing with for many, many years. Um, pump powers, phase matching, nonlinearity tuning, these kinds of things make these problems susceptible to the kinds of strategies that have been adopted in classical nonlinear optics over the last 15 years or so in integrated optics. So for instance, you could say, well, in quantum, I would like a, a system which is small and low power. So I really like my p's to be very small. I think about the total rate of pairs I might get out of a system like this. I want it probably pretty small. And so the obvious strategy is to get the chi 3 up, get the nonlinearity up, get the mode of volume down or anything else that can try and um, somehow effectively get this turn up. So there's one other strategy there, um, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, so this is a, a plot from a, a paper of Tanya Munro a few years ago. That, uh, it's a very familiar idea. This is Miller's rule. This is a relationship between nonlinearity and uh, um, the refractive index in, in glasses. And it turns out that many glasses follow this fairly simple law. And you can do nonlinear optics all over the place. Here's silica that um, we love. 
lots of materials being looked at. In many ways, QDOS has built its story um, for many years right up here. And this is a family of materials <coughs> in the child contracts. That basically means glasses built on group six. Oxygen, selenium, materials like this. So the ones that are we're most well known for are arsenic tri triselenide, arsenic trisulfide, and similar things dubbed with germanium. And these are, if you're an aficionado of nonlinear materials, these are, are beautiful, fascinating, frustrating materials. Um, they have extraordinary nonlinearities, thousands of times silica in some case, with a two photon loss, which is tiny. Um, so that makes a, a very high quality nonlinearity. Get rid of some of that writing. Um, they deposit quite nicely if you get all the, the knobs correct. Um, so therefore, it tends to make a, a great nonlinear material. On the other hand, it's a glass, and so you expect broad Raman responses. That's potentially an issue, and we'll get to that. Um, the other way one can go is uh, an, a semiconductor <coughs> material, and we've looked at a number. I'll just talk today about silicon, but we've done work also in uh, indium phosphide and uh, gallium indium phosphide. Things. Here you've got similar ideas, very strong nonlinearity, figure of merits. In other words, imaginary parts that not aren't that aren't so great. Um, high non high linear index, so you can get really strongly confined modes, get the, the refractor nonlinearity up. Um, but because of the small band gap in silicon, there's lots of parasitic problems to think about, two photon absorption and all the things that come along with that. And we'll talk a bit about um, things you can do apart from the material. So this is where we got started about five years ago. This is a, the kind of arsenic triselenide these trisulfide um, structures that we make. They're basically rib waveguides on silicon silica substrates. Um, these are made at ANU. The experiment is very simple. Um, in this case, it was a CW, so we had a diode laser sped straight into the waveguide. You can see it's, it's small, but not nanoscale. These are a couple of microns across. Um, so the nonlinearities of order, you can see here, about 10,000 times silica. Um, this, uh, the photons are generated, they're separated by an AWG. Now one of the things that makes um, Chi-3 difficult is that the pump tends to be quite close to the, the generated photons. And so as we saw from Dirk yesterday, you have to work pretty hard to get rid of the pump photons if you're actually going to see the signal on idler at all. And in our case, these are often not terribly far away, only a few nanometers. Anyway, you filter those out, you put into the ley line and look for coincidences between um, the two channels. And this was very exciting. We saw a little spike, so this is around 2010, I guess. A little interlude, the way one measures this in this business is this funny kind of metric that gets a fancy name, it's called coincidence for accidental ratio. It really means signal to noise. And it's really a measure of if I see two detectors go ping together, how many times, well, what fraction of the time does that represent a genuine um, generation of a pair, a single pair? And how often is that actually due to the fact that there were maybe two pairs and they just collided by mistake, or something else went wrong in the system, like a Brahman process or a dark count or an after pulsing, etc. These curves tend to look like this. As you drive the system harder, um, you tend to make more multiple pairs, and so the quality of the source goes down. That would tend to encourage you to uh, drive the system more weakly. It's going to drive the actual rate down. It will improve the signal to noise ratio, but you can only go so far because eventually the detectors and projections will start to hit you and this, this thing comes down. So, in this sort of metric, um, in order to even enter the game, you want a number of about 10, you'd prefer maybe 50, and to really play somewhere nicely, you'd like a few hundred. So, our result um, here it is, here's a nice spike, um, and it really looked like this. So a tiny spike, and this noise goes an awful lot further down. So the car that we measured in this experiment was 0.07, or about three orders of magnitude below what it would take to actually start to get interesting. But it's a dot, right? Once you're on the map, you can start to tweak things. The thing that's going wrong in this process is, as I said, this is a, a nonlinear glass that has a lot of Raman. So this is the spontaneous scattering of single photons by um, vibrational modes of the crystal. And in all glasses, that tends to be a relatively broad response to the 10 15 terahertz across. So here's the, if I, my pump is here, here's the signal and idler being generated, here's the Raman spectrum, and some of this is simply contaminated. And in this case, almost all the photons, all the photons we were seeing actually Raman photons, and so the signal to noise is very low. So the first thing you might think is, um, well, maybe if I want to get rid of things involving vibrations, I should cool the crystal. 
So you put the thing in, in liquid nitrogen, you can't really go much colder with these materials because they're not terribly strong. Um, and that has almost no effect at all. So here's the red, that's the room temperature performance, the blue dots, uh, the liquid nitrogen performance, and you'd really like to be up here. <coughs> but I mentioned these are, are strange materials, and one of the nice properties that we flipped here, this is the spontaneous Raman spectrum in this material, it, it peaks kind of just near the pump, falls away over a band with the 15 terahertz or so, and there's this strange, totally unexpected drop here to almost nothing. So if you can design your waveguide in order to get four wave mixing that targets this point, you can expect to see an efficient process um, with almost no Raman response. What, what's the origin of that weird spot? I don't know. Yeah, that would require knowing details of the crystalline structure of the amorphous material. I don't think anybody knows that. It's quite characteristic of these kinds of mm. materials. Silica, of course, looks completely different. And now to do that, we have to redesign the device. There's a um, essentially have to reshape in order to move the forward mixing bandwidth into the right place by playing with the dispersion. But sure enough, you can do that. So you can get these materials up into the regime of maybe 15 to 20 cars. That means it's about ready to start doing quantum experiments. The other alternative, which is, is also possible, you can really dispersion engineer these systems very strongly. You can imagine extending the four-way mixing right out to here, around 20 terahertz, in which case there simply is no Raman spectrum. The, the, the optical phonons don't spread that far, and you could start to see um, what we would imagine would be a very pure system. So that's something we have in mind in the future. Now the other way of, of tackling spurious photons like that is to find a material where Raman is not an issue. And silicon is the obvious one. It's a semiconductor. It's going to have very regular, um, specific lines for its phonon spectrum. And so you simply avoid them. You can do this with any semiconductor. And so people have been playing with silicon, um, on, uh, silicon devices for spontaneous four-way mixing for a while now. Um, so what we did was uh, we had a number of these photonic crystal waveguide devices lying around from our classical work. And we thought, we'll just turn the pump down and stick them in front of some single photon detectors and see what happens. And the point here is um, if, you choose a, if you design your photonic crystal correctly, the first thing that happens in a periodic structure like this is the light is going to slow down. Um, so if I come in with a, um, a, a relatively weak pump beam, at the traditional speed of light, you know, what's going to be a refractory index of silicon 3.4, so 10 to the 8 meters per second or so, moves into the slow light region, the pump will pile up, become more intense, and you can expect a nonlinear to pick up. And the, the slowdown factor is, is of order 10. So this is not kind of walking pace light that you might think of in quantum atomic systems. I prefer to think of this as perhaps, if not slow, at least leisurely, sluggish. So the idea then is to take advantage of the slowdown effect. Um, it comes in very strongly. You get a slowdown, of a, a, a reshaping to order s in the electric field, and so in the nonlinear response, it's actually to the fourth power of that number. So we're moving then from a, a structure that looks like this in the chalcogenide into a silicon device. Our actual um, waveguides are about 100 microns long. This is what they look like. This is the, the slow light spectrum. So this is the, the optical band around 1550. The pump would be sitting here. We were generating uh, pairs across this whole spectrum, but um, picking them off in the detectors about 5, 10 nanometers away. The slow light property in this region, it's a, a group index in this case of about 30. So again, not, not um, walking pace, but really quite slow by normal standards. And you also see that the loss across this region is actually quite good. Normally, in a slow light material, the loss is the first thing that go down. And so um, the group at York and, and at times and Andrews worked very hard to get this performance. So initially, we saw results like this. Again, um, performance that you, know, you can, could actually get photons out, but you wouldn't regard these numbers as stellar. The other thing that's nice is straight away, you can see the impact of nonlinear losses. As a, a silicon, it has a um, strong TPA. If you drive the system too hard, you're going to start to create free carriers, and they act as a loss process, which is going to reduce the performance. And so you can kind of see a roll off in the number of coincidences that are created, and um, it's hard to see in the car curve. Well, a bit of engineering, um, and we were able to get to something that looks like this. This is still a similar device, but a bit of um, work on the quality of the structure and the exact dispersion engineering. 
So we're now hitting cars and these materials of around um, a few hundred. The G2s are below 0.1 or so. The pair rates off the chip um, by other technologies you would consider modest. We're seeing pair rates of perhaps 20 per second. But of course the idea is ultimately, as we saw again yesterday, get everything on chip. Most of this, if this is because of the losses simply getting on and off. And in fact, we, um, the, in, the inferred pair rate inside the system is around 230 kilohertz, around a quarter of a million pairs a second. So if we put everything on, on the chip, you can start imagining these sources working pretty hard. All right, so that's a, a raw kind of source. The real problem is this, we're stuck on this car curve. Well, it's what we call it. The harder you drive the system, the lower the performance of the signal to noise. And you'd really like to break that nexus. And so it was realized a long time ago by um, a group led by Alan Migdal, that, um, Giller at the time, um, that this, if you really want to get around that, you're going to have to use logic. You have to actively control the system. So the, the suggestion was something like this. You have a, a range of sources. You pump all of them. Look for photons from all of them. It's a funny order. Pumps come in. Some of them may fire. You detect which ones of them fire, and you open the gate for just one of them. So again, some fire. I let the first one come through. And what you have the opportunity then to do is to get the same net output rate and yet each system is driven at, if you like, one end less hard, the net effect is that you can move the signal-to-noise ratio across that, um, that constraint. How do you know which one fired? Um, uh, so I will get to that around the time. So our particular configuration looks something like this. So we had a, a bank of um, uh, silicon, the kind of crystal waveguides. This picture is very schematic. In fact, we had two. Um, these were then, the, the light was taken out, coupled through AWGs. The idler was fed into silicon photon detectors, uh, single photon detectors, um, pulled. The other photon, if it exists, has to wait. Okay? Because we have to use an active switching fabric. You have to decide whichever photon you want has to be actively guided into the output channel. That's going to require an active switch. In our case, we used uh, ceramic switches um, for loss reasons. And they're not terribly fast. They, they operate at around 10 gigahertz. So you've really got 100 nanoseconds of time that you've got to kill before the switch is ready to take the photon you're looking for. Which means you need a delay line here of 100, 200 nanoseconds. In the meantime, um, the idler detectors can then report uh, their status to some CMOS logic, and you can then drive the, the, tech, the um, switch fabric with that. So the our structure basically looks like this. We had so this is what they, they look like. We pump them, the pumps come in from the left, you've got these two single devices, they're photons, if they generate them around <coughs> off the sides, off the detectors. And you can see that each of them performed in a, a fairly similar fashion. This is each of them operating one at a time. You turn the multiplexing on, we got this result. Um, the upper line is a perfect situation. Essentially, you get twice as many photons at the same rate. Um, the dotted line is the absolute best you could get given the losses that these switches supported. And you can see that we basically hit that um, on the spot. So we have done as well as you could possibly have do, given the switches that are available, which is a nice place to be, because it tells you if you really want to make this kind of system better, just spend money on switch technology, which a lot of people are interested in. It's, it's a place you don't have to be terribly smart. It's a problem you could solve with cash. So in this case, we are able to move the, the car by about 62%. Um, you can do the same kind of thing if you pump from a single uh, waveguide and just put a wire junction in, um, so a single pump in this case, same kind of performance, same kind of enhancement of, of 63%. Or so. so again, limited by the, detect, uh, by the switches. Then we realize you don't actually have to have two um, waveguides at all. It's one of the great things about light that quite happily walks through each other, so we could also drive this thing from both sides. It's also going to have the advantage that the two, it'll be easier to match the two waveguides to have very similar behavior. So in this case, um, because we're operating 1550, you can just pull circulators off the shelf and drive the pump from both sides, use another circulator to collect out the photons that you get, and again, 
um, use the detection from either side in this case to then bring the photons that come from each side in opposite directions back through that switch fabric and again multiplex. So in this case, we got essentially the same performance. That was the, the single device pumped in each direction separately. You multiplex, um, you lift up again to that theoretical curve. <coughs> I'm going to leave that for a bit. I'll come back to that idea in a moment. Um, at Iona University, the, the experimental program is actually largely focused on, on this technology, uh, the femtosecond laser ray, which we saw mentioned once or twice yesterday in Andrew's talk, and we've, we've done a couple of projects with him. If you don't know this, this system, it's really fairly simple. The idea is if you hit any material with a laser, it will complain. And so they discovered that you can write relatively high quality waveguides um, simply by taking a piece of glass. And I don't have the animated version of this. Essentially, you take a piece of glass, you drag it in front of a femtosecond laser, which is um, shooting out pulses at, at a few megahertz rate, typically. Well, if all else being equal, you should get a relatively high quality, fairly low loss way of trying to describe the device. Of course, the obvious thing is you can get 3D structures simply by moving the laser focus up and down, as well as moving the glass structure back and forth. <coughs> So there's a lot of groups working um, with this technology now. Those um, in the quantum area, I guess there is us, there's Milan, Jena with Alex Zamite, Oxford has done some work, it's very nice. Um, and I just learned today, there's, there's a group right here in Shanghai. I don't know if you've got somebody. Again, it's, it's really about chip scale integration, getting different kinds of devices into, into small spaces. So this technology can do lots of things. You can write lasers, you can write spectrometers, um, you can have a nice way of mapping 2D systems, which for instance come off a telescope that might be pointing at different stars into a linear structure that might be well matched to a detector. We're going to see these kinds of ideas are equally applicable to the quantum regime. Thank um, in fact, one of the really exciting uh, applications of this is in exoplanet hunting, and our ships uh, will shortly be on the Subaru telescope looking for planets, simply because of the, the technology of mapping 2D images of telescopes onto planar arrays. But for us, we're interested in this space. Um, as I said, there's been a lot of work. It started uh, in the quantum regime um, uh, with uh, and it's very much Ray Marshall in our group, and it's then spread really quite broadly, as I said, across a number of these groups, including the bosons sampling results that we heard about yesterday. So um, the, one of the things we've done is it's actually pushed the multiplexing program further. So I said that we had done this with two waveguides in silicon. And at that time, um, we were talking to Sebastian Tanzilli, and we thought maybe we can do the same thing with the lithium ion sources that they generate. Of course, it's now a Chi 2 process. And the idea there being that lithium ion has a lot of nice properties, but it's not necessarily versatile in terms of separating photons, all the kind of plug and play stuff that you really need to make this whole system work. Um, so we created this kind of Frankenstein device. And this is the work of Tom Meany, who's now at Toshiba in, in uh, the UK. Um, there's a lithium ion device here. The photons are actually made here. There's a splitter here. This is made in glass with the femtosecond laser process. There's also a series of, of wavelength splitters, essentially um, WDM devices created in the array here. And then plugged together with hollow fibers, the same kind of delay lines, the switch fabric that we saw before. Here's another picture of this. As I say, Frankenstein, the nice thing about this technology is you can really design waveguides that will match anything if you're clever enough about how you, you arrange their shape and things. Rather like um, 3D printing technology got two things that don't fit together, you simply 3D print the device that sticks them together. Um, so in this case there were two, there were these splitters, and particularly the, the development of this um, array of WDMs was a nice result. You can actually see the waveguides in this case. Um, this is where the pump comes in, the fanned out to these uh, four different Kipling devices. And then four splitters here, which are designed so that a 1300 photon will go one way, a 1500 photon will go the other. The rest is familiar. These all go out to their detectors, right drive the switch fabric. So this is what this looked like. Um, this weren't quite as clean to begin with. Uh, so we've, all four channels didn't perform quite as similarly. This is their raw performance on their own. This is what the performance of one of them, for instance, looks like on its own. 
But when you start to multiplex, um, you can see that both the coincidence rate goes up, and again, your signal-to-noise performance starts to improve. Getting away from multiplexing, what can you actually do that really takes advantage of these 3D kinds of structures? Here's a couple of examples. Um, Andrew talked about this one yesterday, also attributing my contribution. Um, You're welcome. Yeah. Um, obviously, the, the, the strategy is to try and take advantage of these complex 3D structures, see if you can make some of the uh, switch, or rather, um, interferometry architecture take advantage of 3D systems. So, for instance, some devices, uh, a 3 by 3 interference device, have a natural 3D interpretation. And this has been done in fiber a long time ago by Zeilinger. This is where we started out with um, multi wave guide interferometry about four or five years ago. So, again, you, you just write the structure you want. We started from a, a planar three port device coming in, and the waveguides are simply modulated so that they sit in a kind of triangle position. You can expect to see nice three way coupling uh, in this region. Um, the visibility, the, the, the interferometry, uh, the quantum interferometry that happens in a 3x3 device is more complicated. You don't expect to see 100% uh, visibility as you would in a 2x2 HOM system. And in fact, by tuning the coupling rate between these devices, you can pretty much tune um, any combination of visibilities that you like. So here's some old results. You can see that these visibilities are kind of all over the place. Because in fiber, it's very difficult to arrange that you can get a perfect 3 by 3 cup, for instance. So in that case, we had a system look like this. The detection is fairly straightforward. And you can see, again, we got quite nice um, non-classical visibilities, um, more or less matching what was expected from a classical characterization of infinitary. We do the same thing in 4 by 4 There's now a whole lot more things to test. In this case, you can't work out the unitary purely by classical means, or at least we didn't at the time, because Matthew Broom hadn't invented this technique. Um, so in this case, we worked out the internal performance by a combination of classical and uh, quantum measurements, and then used that to predict the rest of the quantum structure. So you can do interferometry, that's fine. What can you do that's exciting about that? Well, if we think of things like um, multi interferometry, the basic idea is you're getting multiple photons to do more work for you. So if I have a two-photon system and they both travel through the um, some phase I'm trying to understand, <coughs> then I get a, an increased signal-to-noise in, in a switching curve, or in a, in a, a response curve. And, you know, that's essentially the noon state advantage. So if you think about the same kind of thing, you might get a 3x3 three three structure. And this was looked at by the Milan group, theoretically, a couple of years ago then the same thing kind of will continue to happen. If you can put more photons in, and if you can take advantage of the structure to make sure that they all go through the, the whatever phase you're trying to represent, trying to characterize, you should be able to do a better job of, of um, measuring that. So we've uh, recently attempted to do this in, um, or at least the first steps was that in the, the famous second system. This came out in SciRep last week. This is the job of our student, Zachary Chavoyer. Here's the structure. In this case, um, it's a 3D one. One of the arms comes up to the surface, and there's simply a, a metal heater placed on top that creates a thermal gradient um, in the vertical direction. And by adjusting that voltage, you can change the effective phase difference between these three point guides. Obviously, this is a very strongly cross-talked kind of system. In glasses, the thermal um, concentration tends to spread around quite strongly. So you've got to take account of that. Um, there's a lot of visibility curves to measure in a system like this because there's a lot of photons and a lot of pathways. I should say, we did this with the two photon experiment. We don't actually have a working three photon source at the moment. Um, but the net result is you can see uh, the change is, as you move from distinguishable to indistinguishable, actually line up the two photons at the same time. You can see the change in um, the photon interference fringes, the period, and you can start to see um, visibilities that match or uh, visibilities from quantum, the classical regime, that match the predictions extracted from the, the classical unitary. What you could do with that, if you calculate the Fisher information, then we are right about here. Um, the limit for the, um, how well you can do for two photons in a three photon device is this line. The limit for how well you could do in terms of uh, measuring phases for two photons in a two arm device is here, so we're certainly above that. And we seem to be just at the regime that if we had a second phase, so if we had two controllers, two thermal response, we could use one to tune ourselves across this curve 
um, and HEPA cells always targeted here, we could then measure the other unknown phase um, to uh, subshock noise level. And we're currently developing a device that will allow us to have one heater on the side, one heater on the top. Um, something, what more fundamental can you do with the 3D systems? Um, one of the things, of course, quantum walks are interesting. One of the things that's frustrating about quantum walks is you really only see the light at the end, what comes out, and you can see I have developed entanglement or I have not, but it's not so easy to see it evolve. I mean, two approaches to try this. Here's a, a sort of virtual cutback experiment from Bristol, where they simply made uh, cutbacks which were longer and they tried to look at the development. Unfortunately, um, they were just unlucky and they picked three points here. So although the visibility in theory should have quite complex evolution, they were able to show that it just goes down. So you would like to do better than that if you can get luckier. Here's an experiment from the Silverhorn group um, where they did this in bulk, essentially in time domain. In this case, they can start to see the evolution of entanglement um, in the structure. So here's an experiment we haven't done, but I think is an illustration of what you can do with this kind of system. Um, this was thought up by a uh, previous post by Mike Delante. So you've got a bunch of waveguides come in, you imagine a 3D structure where they're coupled in loops in a vertical fashion, and once a cycle, they have the opportunity to couple back into the input-output waveguides, and off they go. So you can imagine that the operation, the photon comes in, there's coupling, there's an evolution operator around the ring, they may or may not come out, and off you go. And you do some algebra. Um, here's, what you, here's what would happen um, if I see two photons coming out at the same time. Then step by step you can of course, see the photons evolve and you can start to see the way the correlation um, would evolve. And by making the ring small enough you can make the, the development in each loop small enough that you can really make sure that you could resolve the change in visibility. Because it's not guaranteed that the photons will even come out at the same time. So you can also see the separate contribution as they are together, as they spend time apart, um, and start to see delayed effects. This is something we would like to do that hasn't happened yet. Right, the last thing I would like to talk about um, is back on the theory side, largely. Squeeze it in. Um, let's talk about the biphotons again, the photon production process. This is a, a description of Hamiltonian, a bit more fancy than before. Basically, there's some complicated operation which describes the way those four modes are mixing. And the biphoton would normally be represented in some kind of fashion like this. There's essentially a wave function for how different frequency components are represented or are superposed in the overall state. You would like to understand the property of this biphoton. So people tend to plot this in, in at least the amplitude in a, a plot like this as a function of the two frequencies that the photons come out. What is the probability that any two um, contributions will be measured, essentially? And these things tend to have um, this kind of, if you don't work hard, this kind of anti-correlated shape. Um, this direction is essentially controlled by the bandwidth of the pump. The other direction is controlled by the phase matching properties. So if you can... Um, engineer the structure, engineer your pump, engineer the, the phase matching, you can change the shape of this in principle. Quite often, for instance, you'd like it to be circular, because that means that when you have a, a pair source, if you detect one, the other will be projected into a pure state and will represent something that really looks like a single photon. Here's a prime. This, or this is another strategy. Okay, so we've thought about what would happen. This is work of Luke Held, who's a, a research fellow at Macquarie. What would happen if you start to think about the fact that these waveguides have loss? And many of them have significant loss. Over the course of, of a pair production device, you might have 1, 2, even 3 dB of loss along the course of the waveguide. And so both the rate at which photons are created down the structure is going to evolve, and the, the life they experience due to scattering once they've been created will also evolve down the structure. So this, uh, this, this is a very long paper which has come out in NJP late last year. But the next story looks like this. Because of the dissipation, um, you can expect that we now have to talk about this in density matrix picture rather than in a cat. Um, but if you care about that part of the density matrix which corresponds to just two photons, it's going to look more or less like this. Um, the same kind of thing. And in fact, that, that part of the system is still dynamic. So the, to, in the simple system, all that's going to happen is your biphoton will be um, 
cleaned up a bit or, or distinguished a bit depending on the losses of the two photons. But if you look at it more closely, what happens is the following. This is, this is the full expression for the biphoton. This is the phase matching part that people are familiar with. Normally, this part here um, would give you a delta function and essentially tells you that um, this integral collapses into something where the, the pump is simply evaluated at the generated frequencies. In the presence of the loss, as well as um, this phase matching, you now have what you could think of as loss matching. The system moves, the, the frequency response moves into the complex plane, and you have to think about what the loss is doing in the system. If the losses turn out to be balanced, then not terribly much happens. For instance, if um, the pump loss might simply dominate, here's a, the, the raw lossless case. You can just see some sink fringes from the phase matching here. The, the loss will tend to clean that up, and you might actually, for instance, see that the Schmidt mode, the number of modes in your system, will actually go down. If you're a little more clever, or lucky, <coughs> in the wrong order. <coughs> what we're supposed to see, I've got two plots in the same point. What we're supposed to see here is, by judicious choice of, of um, loss function, you can actually clean up something that looks quite anti-correlated into something that's going to be very close to a single mode. You'll lose some photons, of course, but you still actually um, get a higher quality state. So sometimes the loss can actually work for you. Um, the final thing I want to mention in the same spirit is how that affects a very recent idea, which is stimulated emission tomography. How can you characterize um, quantum states like this without having to go to the very long process of measuring pairs across every point of a biphoton spectrum? So there's a, a recent idea introduced by John Seip and Marco Liscadini, which is the realization that the biphoton function is essentially exactly the same response function as in the nonlinear system. So if you drive a system with your pump field and a little bit of classical signal, you'll measure some spontaneous um, down conversion. Oh, sorry, some stimulated down conversion or some stimulated four-wave mixing. And the nature of that is exactly the same as the nature of the biphoton. So you can learn what's happening much faster. Um, we've looked at how that is influenced by loss. And the story is the following. Um, in the, the Chi 2 case, typically you would rather look <coughs> at this using um, down free difference frequency generation. Because in that case, the, the pump source is precisely the same as the source that would be involved in the, non, in the spontaneous process. In, um, if I was to instead use, oops, let's that. If I was to instead use some frequency generation, which works equally well in theory, the problem is that um, you're driving the system down here. You're going to generate a different kind of response to the pump that would actually be used in the nonlinear generation process. Uh, unfortunately, um, it turns out that when you calculate the response functions, it's the SFG which has the same kind of loss matching as the spontaneous process. So if you really want to understand what the classical process is saying about the spontaneous one, you have to use the process which is not the one you would wish. And I think that's perhaps um, something worth knowing. So for instance, in this case, if you use the DFG, you'll get the right answer if you have no loss or if your losses are perfectly balanced. Um, but otherwise, you're not going to predict the right non-classical state. Um, Andrew is glaring at me on Jingo, Jingo and a half. Um, so I, yeah. I couldn't think of any general conclusion, so I did that thing where you list everything you did. Um, and in fact, it's, it's recursive. Because um, that one is this page. Thank you very much. We have time for one question from Michael. How do you handle loss in a Hamiltonian evolution? Uh, very good. So, so we, um, so what Luke did in that case, there's several ways you could you could go master equation, etc. What we did was um, put in operators or uh, modes for all of the lost states, and then trace over them and okay. look what happens. And it's fortunate that the two photon part that survives turns out to be diagonal. You take some limit as the number of loss modes goes to infinity? Or? Uh, what you find is you can argue pretty convincingly that the coupling to every mode is identical because it's point no. scattering. And so that integral That's respectable. Yeah. You said one. All right. So I'm actually very interested in the phonon, phonons that you mentioned. I understand that it's mysterious. I understand that it's mysterious why the uh, phonon effect disappears at some level, but 
um, on some deep level, I worry about integrated optics in terms of exactly that. You know, you have crystal structures, you have phonons. So is there any big picture message you have about phonons and the limitations? Yeah, so um, I, I think I would try, normally try and not engineer through the middle, as we did there, but try and jump over. So there's lots of examples of that in silica already, where one uses the phase matching in such a way that the conversion is 300 nanometers away. Um, so that there's simply no potential for the Raman to contaminate the photons you're interested in. You can do the same kind of things in these structures. And we have a, I have a, a theory student at the moment working on another strategy which I think can get around that problem quite nicely. Yeah, if there are no further questions, let's uh, join me in thanking Michael again. Thank you.